Welcome to the Coffee with Creators podcast, a podcast for creators by creators. And I'm your host, Michael, a content creator, work from homer and pizza eater. Today, I am joined by two other creators, and one of them is helping me co-host today's episode. And this person is none other than our friend, Yi. Hello, Yi. Hello, hello. Welcome back. How are you doing? Doing good. Great to be back. Always love being here with you. Fun to spend time with you. That makes me... I see you. I see you trying to it's manage too the far sound. For me, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to reach over. I'm like, I should have moved this earlier. So, guys, if you guys are listening and you're hearing like this music going up and down, that's me. I'm sorry. It's my fault. But um, <laughs> lesson learned. But good to have you again, Yee. I'm always, uh, I'm always happy, happy to have you here because we, I feel like we always have like these very um, interesting conversations. Like last episode, we talked about Black Friday, and we talked about. That'd yeah, your your little accident, he's accident. So, if you guys want to know, oh right, <laughs> yes, go go listen to the go previous podcast to, to know what my accident was. You yeah, will enjoy exactly. that. Well, I, I think you'll yeah, enjoy I that. enjoyed it. I think people will enjoy it. So, yeah. um, thank you for sharing that, Yi. But um, today we're we have a special guest with us, an incredible person. Uh, today we have uh, my good friend Brad. Brad is the the producer director of. <laughs> The commercial that was shot for my company, my product, uh, the Drop and the Dock Wireless Charger, and uh, you know Brad was intro from, you know my my colleague Lydia, and you know Brad did just a phenomenal job. Uh, so Brad is here with us today. Very excited to have him here. Uh, Brad, can you just introduce yourself really quickly? You know who you are, what you do, uh, and you know what what yeah what do you what do you do these days got it hey uh thanks for having me on um my name is brad wong i'm a music video and commercial director based out in los angeles and yeah <laughs> i love yeah, that i know <laughs> it sounds so cool yeah uh so brad i mean i i think just just to lay you know some some context for for the for the listeners you know, like, what is it, you know, what does a day-to-day or, or week-to-week look like for you? Yeah, well, what I like about my job is that every day is different. Every week is different. Every month is different. Um, I'm the type of person who um, loves doing different types of projects. And being a freelance commercial and music video director kind of affords me that luxury where I'm working on something new every week, every month. And... Um, yeah, what a typical week looks like is um, I'll usually spend time pitching on RFPs. Uh, that's requests for proposals from labels or agencies. Um, and a lot of that has some sort of bidding involved. Um, and then other weeks I'll actually be on set and I'll be in production mode directing and working with artists or clients. And then another week, or on some other weeks, I'll also, you know, edit some stuff. So it, it really varies. Yeah. I know that, like, we we met right uh, before COVID hit. And so, like, some, some things to be said about that. One is, right when we met, I was like, I know that what I loved about working with you was like, hey, I was like, hey, Brad, uh, we have this project, but we have a limited budget. Can you work with us? And I think you're the first person I've met in my life who genuinely is capable of working with a limited budget, but executing on a like insane level. <laughs> I, I never told you this. Recently, a, uh, a retailer from Indonesia reached out to a distributor in Singapore. But basically, long story short, that person said the commercial that you filmed was the best ad he had ever seen in yes. his life. And that yes. he's like, he was like, I have to get this product. I have to sell this product. And I'm like, wow. Right. Like working with you was just a huge pleasure because I was like, well, I, I like to be really involved. And I think you are more than uh, more than happy to have me be involved. Uh, but to also like I think the communication was great. The working style was great. Uh, but I knew that I could trust in you to execute on everything. Uh, and I, I guess like with that, you know, how does that how does my experience where like I felt like we were really tight, really like really well integrated, small lean crew. Although in this case, you know, uh, Brad told me he was like, "Hey, it's gonna be a, like a lean, uh, a lean crew today." And the day one, it was like 20, uh, 
25 people. <laughs> and I was like, this is lean. This is small. I, I do crap. remember you showing me the um, the footage because this was yeah during during um, the, the beginning of COVID. And you're, you said you told me that you were uh, you were with a friend. You're shooting a commercial. And he's like, it's a, it's a small like crew, and I'm like, I'm looking at the footage, and I'm like, it doesn't look like. I mean, to me, a small group of people will be five. <laughs> yeah. There's definitely yeah, more than exactly five. right, and like, yeah, and, and so we yeah we saw oh it's a lean crew and everything, but regardless, you know, Brad made it work, and so Brad like I'm curious like my experience there where everyone's like all hands on deck, everyone's super involved, like is that really how like is that how all of your shoots tend to work out, or is just like because that was like us doing like a side project it's very different from you doing like your music videos and what yeah yeah well it really depends going back to working within budgets i've worked on all different types of budgets from you know super indie to you know agency budgets and um yeah it, i've learned just through my experience that you can make a lot of things happen with small budgets and you can make things happen with large budgets. It just depends how creative and innovative you are. And it also depends on the content you create too. Like with your project, we knew that we wanted to go lifestyle. So that really, really helped us maximize the budget. And uh, in terms of crew sizes, um, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, small crews, lean crews usually work faster than larger crews, but I'm used to having larger crews and sometimes it takes like twice as long even though you have more people. So it really just depends on the project and you know, like the workflow of everything. So I have a quick question yeah. regarding budgeting. When you first got into the industry, was that part of your your training or was that part of the, the, the thing that you you were at least aware of? Like, okay, I gotta work with um, this budget because like if I'm thinking of myself when I was you know, when I was younger, and if I imagined myself to be a filmmaker or a director, I'll be like, yeah, I'll have helicopters and explosions and all that stuff without even considering how much it's going to cost. You know what I mean? So was that a, uh, a part of your expectations, at least when you first got into the industry? I did know that there was an aspect of bidding involved um, with projects, especially projects from labels and agencies. Um, you're trying to walk a thin line between making it a good deal for your client and, you know, maximizing the budget to where you do good work and also, you know, pay yourself as well. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I knew there was that aspect in this industry. What I learned from working in the industry all of these years is that I guess you really just have to set expectations with your client. if they're the ones to give you a budget you could be like they could be like oh we have 40k to do this project and you can be like okay well we can do this this and this and mm -hmm. as long as you're transparent with that um you can make budgets work or you can request more or be like hey i think this is going to cost a little less uh how do they react when you say that when they say when you what have you had clients where they're like okay we want to do all of this Mm -hmm. with this and i'm not talking about ye <laughs> okay right. so i'm just thinking of other clients that are you know kind of like they, their their expectations are not um realistic have you had experiences like that um yes and no um usually when i'm working with clients i'll work with an account manager or a creative director and they usually yes. have some sort of idea of what things cost um, usually as part of the process, I'll turn in a budget spreadsheet with like a breakdown of all the costs and stuff. And um, that usually helps, you know, solidify my case for asking for more or saying we could do it for less or we can do it right within the pocket that you give us. And um, what was I going to say? As, yeah, what I've learned is as long as you're upfront, you're transparent, you justify all your decisions. Um, usually clients are willing to listen. Oh, that's great. And I, yeah, and I've been yeah. fortunate enough to work with some great clients. Uh, out of curiosity, Brad, and if you can share this, if not, it's totally fine, but like, what is the largest budget uh, that you've worked with you know, for, for a shoot? Um, I'd say it was around 100K. 
And it was that was that for a music? No, video? it wasn't. It was for a uh, a commercial, yeah, yeah. for like a, a major company. So, was this like a like a thirty second spot or something? Yeah, but it was part of a larger campaign that had like other stuff involved. So we had to shoot other deliverables that went to other uh, teams. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious, like, just to give uh, a little bit of like perspective, is a hundred k for a thirty second spot? Um, well, uh, you know, for a major brand, for example, is that a, what's the, what, I guess, does that sound fair? Like in the market, you know what I mean? Like, is that a, a low price or is that like a steal? It, it does <laughs> kind of sound like a steal to me. Yeah. Like, I think yeah. it was a steal. And the uh -huh. thing is, um, what I've noticed is that, I mean, at least from my perspective, we mm -hmm. only get our own production budget. We don't know how much they're spending on ads. We don't know how much they're spending on other teams or what they're going to do with the other deliverables we shoot. So mm -hmm. all I see is what they give me and my team. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now you have a solid uh, group of people that you work with, or does it always change? Yeah, I, I have a solid group of crew heads that I typically work with. Um, if I'm doing a label video, sometimes they'll ask um, to see different crew heads so that way the artist can pick and choose um, but usually I work with the same consistent people how and it's, interesting yeah it's, it's been great it's it's such an interesting uh, um, I guess field of work because it's like I'm not even gonna get into the whole why the artist wants someone else but it's so hard to find people that you can rely on you can trust right and having to change that I feel like I'm just going to go crazy. I don't know. How do you well, feel about I'll, that? I'll you? actually tell you, this reminds me of a story. Um, uh -huh. So I was pitching a major label on a video and the commissioner was like, oh, okay, uh, who's shooting? Who's going to be doing makeup? So I create this uh, spreadsheet matrix of everyone with their reels. And I had two friends who were DPs that I really wanted to work with and like put them on because I always try to put my friends on, especially mm -hmm. if it's like a, a project that can help their careers. Stuff. But these two friends um, just were super lazy about updating their reels. They uh, didn't really post their work on social media and stuff. When they had great work, they were just it would, just wasn't important to them. Right. And even when I pitched them and vouched for them, they were like, oh, they haven't done re anything recently or it looks like they haven't done anything recently or you know, all their work isn't aggregated into one link that we can see and show the artists and the team. And they lost out on that opportunity. That's unfortunate. And that, that sucks too, because like they were, obviously you were looking out for them, mm -hmm. but they weren't considering the fact that, you know, they're now representing you as well. Right. Right. Like, because you guys are working together. So if you say that, yeah, these guys are awesome. And then they really don't have much to show for that that your reputation kind of takes a hit, you know what I mean? So that kind of sucks, but I guess it's 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 part of the the whole game. Yeah, it is a game, totally yeah. a game. Like before I came out, I wasn't like really big into posting, you know, work online or like trying to post stuff every day. But because of that one, you know, anecdote, that story, I became very, very aware of like, you know, staying up to date posting yeah. things when they come out yeah. really, really, um, I'd say milking it. I don't know if that's a great word, but like really just being like, I, Hey, this is what I've done, you know? Right. No. Yeah. I, I could, I get what you're saying though. Um, yeah. are you originally from, where were you originally from? I'm from Phoenix, it, Arizona. So how was that? When, since when did you move to, uh, LA? I came out to LA in 2013, right after college. Oh, that's a long time ago. Yeah. How did that feel? <laughs> it was cool because um, growing up in an Asian family, my parents obviously wanted me to be a doctor. I actually uh, dual tracked as a pre-med physiology major. And right after I took biochemistry, I was like, man, this sucks. My heart isn't in it. I can't do this. And I was like so good. I thought I was doing all the right stuff. So I, you know, got like a coveted volunteer position at the, the cancer center at uh, the University of Arizona. I did all the pre-med clubs, but mm -hmm. my heart wasn't in it. And I had always loved film. 
And so like my sophomore year, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. And my parents were like, as long as you, you know, do your physiology as a backup, then you can, you know, do your, do the film major. So I took all the summer school classes and got into the BFA program, which was only like 14 people. Uh, so Brad, what was, what was it like when you first came out to LA? You know, like, how did you, like, how did you go about getting into the industry? The film yeah, industry? yeah. Uh, luckily I had a plan. I'm someone who likes to plan and I can't do things. Well, I can do things on the fly, but I'd rather do all the prep. That way you can be the most creative, you know, if you know you have like a safety net to uh, fall back on. So I had jobs lined up already when I moved out to LA and it was because during film school, I would like sneak out to LA and like work on sets or like try to connect with managers and clients. That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. So you were kind of, you've, you've kind of planted the seed earlier on and then, so you were just starting to slowly move yourself basically. So you had the dream already, you had the, uh, the vision, but you know, I do want to talk about one thing because he, Brad mentioned that, you know, being in an Asian uh, family and he jokingly said that his parents wanted him to be a doctor. Maybe a lot of listeners don't realize this, but that is a real thing in the Asian community. It's like real. it does. Yeah. The pressure is real. It's crazy. It's like um, you don't want to disappoint them. You know, you do, I don't want to disappoint my 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 dad wanted me to be the uh, to to join the military. Mm. I am nowhere near. I am not that type of person who will be in the military at all. Um, my mom wanted me to but to be an architect. If I didn't want to be an architect, she wanted me to be an engineer. Yeah, none of those happened. You know, instead I started drawing. And mm. then I remember my dad, this is a long time ago, when he was, you know, when I was still a kid, he asked me, um, he said, okay, so you want to draw for the rest of your life. He's like, how are you gonna make money doing that? And these, you know, these questions sometimes may feel like they're being mean to you, but they're not, you know, my dad was really just looking out for me. He really mm -hmm. wasn't wondering. Like, right, like how are you going to succeed yeah. in life if yeah. you just draw? So being, you know, having the, the, the a very similar uh, kind of like cultural background, Brad, um, I imagine there's a lot of internal battle there when you were deciding, you when you knew that you wanted to be become a filmmaker. So what was the, uh, the point in your life or in your career where you're like, okay, I have the backups already or, um, you know, I'm just gonna go for whatever I want. Or was it was it the plan all along? You're, you're like, okay, I know my parents want me to become a doctor. So I'm gonna do is I'm going to line up all my backups, but they're just that, they're just backups, but I'm really going to go all in, in this creative side. Was that the case? Or did you just one day said, you know what? This is what makes me happy. I'll go for that one. Yeah, well, I'll backtrack a little bit, um, starting with like how I got into film and I think it'll provide a little more context mm -hmm. for my decision. So growing up, um, my dad was actually in journalism, uh, taught journalism at the university, uh, worked in broadcast journalism as an EP executive producer for a number of years for the local news channels. And so I grew up around lights, cameras. I remember him, you know, editing on tape and stuff and being little and like following him into the editing bays to like watch stuff or to have him watch other editors, you know, edit promo pieces or news stories. So I grew up around that. And also um, we had a, a family video camera. And so growing up uh, for Mother's Day, my dad would always make us do like music video covers um, oh, that's yeah, so for my mom and stuff. So we'd always like act in them and pretend to lip sync in them. And then he'd take all the footage and uh, edit it on like an old school tape deck. And then he'd like print the tape and then we'd all watch, you know, what we created together with my mom on, or for my mom on Mother's Day. That is Day. cool. Yeah. That is a cool story. Yeah. So I grew up around that and um, he was actually not only my biggest inspiration for going along the, the video path, but mm -hmm. he was also one of the biggest proponents of trying to tell me not to do it. Um, because he taught 
you know, journalism and was in the industry. Now, granted, it's a different industry, right? Uh, he'd always be like, oh, I always see like students with stars in their eyes. They want to go out to LA and, you know, work in big markets and stuff. And then they end up getting crushed. And I just want to prepare you for that. And I know it came out of love and stuff, mm -hmm. but I think that lit a fire under me to prove him wrong and stuff. So, back to your question um when i realized that i wanted to you know pursue a career in film and the creative industry it was more about you know hitting all these milestones in order to provide like solid evidence to my parents that i was you know doing the right thing and i think one of the biggest milestones was when one of my you know films got into the uh, cannes international film festival uh, while I was a, se a senior in college. That's huge. Yeah. I, it wasn't like in competition or anything, but it was uh -huh. in the, it's called the Court Metrage. So it was a part of the official Cannes Film Festival. It was just in like the short film corner. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Okay, yeah. so what, 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 that's, that's right? Yeah. yeah. What, what was, what was their yeah. reaction when they, when they, did you surprise them with this one or did they know that you were kind of working? Uh, on the side, you know, to get this, you know, you know, a part, to become a part of that, or so no, what, they, what happened? they they didn't. I just told them that, you know, I got the letter to go to Cannes, How and cool. they were like, "Oh my gosh, you you gotta go!" And luckily, you know, they they helped pay for my ticket to go, and I was able to enjoy like a, a week at the festival. It was great. This is, this touched on something that I I want to ask yeah. you, Brad. Uh, for me. As I went through building my company, um, uh, you said that, you know, your dad was uh, like an opponent of you doing, you know, going to this. And even though he himself, you know, had been basically in a similar or tangential field. Um, and, and for me, personally speaking, my mom has been the biggest opponent of me going into my own business strictly because she herself had, you know, had, done, had run a business with my dad. And it had been so tough, so right. grueling. And so she knows exactly what's in store. And so she's like, I don't want right. you to do this. I want you right. to do something else. And funny enough, both you and I have said, oh, no, yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> screw that. I'm going to, it lights that fire. You're like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to lean into it even yeah. more now. But along the way, like you say, okay, one of your biggest like accomplishments or one of the, one of the key points was like, oh, you got that feature. You, know, you, you, you got into, uh, you got into the film festival and, so what I want to hear more is, you know, for me, I know what my little achievements are that really validated, oh, okay, I'm making forward progress. The thing my is, forward my forward progress and my achievements are not always or ever going to be recognized by my mom uh, in the sense of like, oh, she doesn't recognize how important it is to me that I hit this mm -hmm. milestone, but that's fine, right? I can celebrate it on my own because I know it matters right. to me. So, you know, what are some other milestones for you? that you're like, yeah, this is like the next step, the next step. And like, like you feel like, okay, this helped me realize this and this helped me realize that. Like, what are some standout moments yeah, for you? Yeah, um, back to the beginning, I think the first one was getting into the uh, BFA program. They only took like yeah. 14 to 20 applicants. And because I decided to go so late, I had to like fast track it through summer school and, you know, taking extra classes you know, pass the course load in addition to my physiology classes and stuff. And so when I got into the BFA program, because hundreds of people applied at my school, uh, I was mm -hmm. ecstatic and it kind of proved to me that I was on the right track. Because I, I come from a, a Christian background, so um, if it's relevant, you know, um, I, I, I believe that, you know, God has a plan for all of us and mm -hmm. that things will be accomplished uh, in his timing, not our timing mm -hmm. and stuff. And so I was like, if I apply and I don't get in, then it's not meant to be, right? Obviously, or I have to take yeah. a different path. When I got in, I was like, yeah. oh my gosh, this is like the biggest confirmation I've ever gotten to do that path because I was so conflicted I had all my friends doing pre-med, pre-law, everything like that. And so being in that environment, it kind of 
also low key pressures you because you like see all your friends like going so hard into this major because they want to be like doctors so bad. And I know that, you know, some of them didn't want to be doctors, but they were just too deep into it, you know. So that confirmation in college was a big milestone that I hit. Yeah. And then what about so at post college, you know, post grad, now you're in LA. Like, what are like, is there some, like, is there like a standout like project or milestone that you hit that you're like, okay, this is even more confirmation that I'm heading down the right path where I'm doing something? Yeah, I think another milestone is when, you know, I started getting hit up by major labels and it all started with one project. And it, (laughs) can you say which project this was? (laughs) I think it was a music video called Bad for You. Interesting. Okay. Yep. Um, worked with this really, really talented producer who who um, was trying to be an artist at the time. And he had gotten signed to one of Atlantic's subsidiaries. And so I did that video um, low budget uh, because they were he was a new artist. Uh, they were putting some money into him, but not like the whole the whole pot. And so mm-hmm. when I executed yeah. that with my friends and with a great crew, um, they were like, wow, you were able to do this on that budget. Let's throw some more stuff at him and see what he can do. So from there, I just built a name and, you know, got on their roster. And now they send me, you know, RFPs and invite me to pitch on stuff. So yeah, that was another milestone. How do you pitch projects? I'm just curious. Like, do you have the vision as well? Like, do you have the vision? Do you make the storyboards? Do you like talk us through that, that process? If someone reaches out to you and say, Hey, this company, I don't know. Um, I can think of a company. Um, we have a water bottle company. I don't know. Some, something, right? Like right, they have right. a budget of this and we want you to, uh, to pitch. Like, is that, is that how it works or do they, uh, contact you with already with a, a pre-made um, concept, right? Like we want to to be more lifestyle. We want to be more like this. How does that work? Yeah, it actually just depends on the client and what their creative directors or whoever higher up has mm. in mind for mm-hmm. the project or the particular campaign. Uh, and I'll I'll go um, through two paths. the The first path within music video world is hey. We have X number of dollars to do this. Creative is wide open. I want you to pitch for this project. And if the artist likes it, then you get to the next round and you actually, you know, talk to them on Zoom or you talk to, you know, marketing on Zoom or before COVID, it was in person Uh and stuff sometimes. So that's the second layer. the other path for like commercials and stuff is um, sometimes they'll be like, hey, we have this budget or, hey, we want you to create something with this messaging. Um, from there, you, you know, work with the team to create boards or you, you know, send a, a pitch and stuff. Or if they give you boards, you're like, OK, I think we could do this for this amount of money. This is how I would augment it. This is what I would take away. What do you mm-hmm. think? And then you just keep that conversation going until they're like, hey, you got the bid, <laughs> you know? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> that, and other that... times it's less transparent. Other times you'll just like submit something and you won't hear back. And then the project comes out and stuff. So it, it's oh. all a game. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's almost the same with just about, I'm starting to realize this. Like when I started my, my, this whole Instagram thing, I was figuring this this stuff out like okay how do I how do I pitch myself or how do I how do brands approach me how do how do these 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 entities reach out to me and ask me how much it's going to cost and I noticed that there's so many different ways of doing it Mm -hmm. and so in my little world I feel like it's just so messy there's got to be an industry industry standard but it seems like it's not really the case like it seems like in every not every probably, but like for you, for example, in in your industry, it seems similar. Is that the same case with you? Like, how, how is your, what's your view on this one? 
Because I feel like it's just a messy, I mean, it feels like the Wild West when it comes to stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, but I understand. Like, I understand what, it's like if I'm trying to get a contract or do something, right? You bid it yeah. out. You know, you bid out a project. So same thing. You just try to see who you who, who do you think you can trust to do the best job for you. And I, I get that that's what happens in this case with Brad as well. Um, I, I think one, one part I'm quite curious about is, so, so Brad, when you are working with these like labels or these artists and you're shooting like an MV, uh, do you go, like, do you execute and pitch in the same way of just like trying to be as like efficient uh, cost wise? But like like you were with us, we just like scale it up in terms of like how much they're willing to to spend. Like, are you just as like lean in, in the spending? Exactly. Yes. Um, you have to be efficient with your time uh, because you know you could put like fourteen hours, you know, a day into a project and only get paid for like one or two days of work. Yeah. Um, even if you work like a week and mm -hmm. stuff um so you, you have to be mindful of the time you spend on a project especially on proposals and bids where you don't get paid for that time and stuff it's yeah it's all you know for the sake of the game so you want to be efficient but you also want to do good work too and i can't stress that enough you want to always do the best work you can um mm -hmm. either within the budget or you know above and beyond the budget like it, and what i mean by that is giving them more for their money even though you know that you know you're going to spend a little extra time on it and i've always believed in you yeah. know having good work ethic i like yeah. what you said there and i i yeah. have to say this i have to um share this because but i unfortunately i can't remember the the name of the person who said this but i know it was one of those uh the, the guys who worked for a um, full-time filmmaker, I think, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And I think he had like a, a he, he, I forgot his name, but he, he has his own channel, I think. And he said something that just stuck with me and basically is what you were saying. And when he said that um, when you have a limited amount of budget, like when you have, when, basically when they're not paying you much, that's when you have to make sure that you really give your best work. Right. Because I think it matters. It matters to to everything and to yourself, to, to to your clients. That you know, no matter what you do, you have to try to churn out the best work possible. You know, because I feel like a lot of creators, um, we already we it's easy for us to limit ourselves based on, hey, this is all I got. You know what I mean? But if you think about creativity in general, creativity is basically working with what you have, what you currently have. Right. If you are given all the things, all the tools, everything, it's hardly I, you could say that you can be more creative because you have more tools to play with. But I think, you know, the creative brain really works with being, you know, when it's being resourceful. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I just wanted to point that out because what you said, I, I guess that just resonated with me. I like that. I like that. It's not always about this client's paying me the most so that therefore he will have the best results you know right. what i mean so it could be possible objectively because you have more to play with but it doesn't mean that you if you're someone's paying you less or you have a small budget that you give subpar uh, right. results i guess right and i think uh going back to that point as long as you're transparent and upfront with like what it's going to look like or what they're going to get for that budget if you're like hey yeah, we can work within that budget, but we can only do X, Y, and Z. I think if those conversations are had up front or through, even throughout the process, uh, you can set expectations and just make sure everyone's on the same page. Have there been times when you've been restricted because of the budget uh, and time and like just like resource energy or whatever it might be, where you ultimately have to put out a, a deliverable that you're not like, extremely proud of like do you have those moments or do you feel like or do you just like you work on it until you're like yeah like, okay this is good <laughs> right yeah well clients always want something yesterday right especially in uh the music industry um they'll always be like hey we need to shoot this video during this week uh you have two weeks to turn it in and stuff and then the video won't come out for like two months and so so um <laughs> 
working within certain time frames is a norm and one thing that I've become really efficient at. Um, but I do know that you don't always have the luxury to keep, you know, making it the best it can be just because, you know, you got to turn out, you know, products for the machine yeah. mm -hmm. and stuff. So with those projects, I think actually with every project, um, you have to leave your ego at the door. You have to bring your, you know, obviously your, your standards, your work ethic, and, you know, your professionalism and all of the skills you've built up in the industry to make the product the best it can be. But ultimately, you have to leave your ego at the door because, you know, there's more than one cook in the kitchen. They're going to have their opinions. They're going to have their own timelines. And you're not going to win a lot of the, the battles to, you know, do something in a specific way, whether that's with timing, whether that's with creative and stuff or maybe you know one of the stakeholders will be like i think this should be in the piece and you like vehemently disagree with it but you got to leave your ego at the door because ultimately you want to keep the project moving and out because if the project gets delayed then you and your team don't get paid from my experience it's it's the whole well, I only have a, a you know this amount of time and you know um, resources to create whatever it is that um, that they want. And sometimes I wonder if it's just my personal expectations as to what I can deliver. Mm -hmm. But and I, when you said that you have to leave your ego at the door, and I think I think that's what it is really for me. It's my ego. Right. It's the whole. I know I can do better. It's right. just unfortunate that I can't. I don't have enough time to do this. And right. So you have to kind of just yeah. move move along. Yeah. 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 And um, oftentimes, you know, the decisions that, you know, other stakeholders make, mm -hmm. they aren't personal. Uh, it's just in terms of they make the decisions in terms of, you know, what they've been taught to do or in terms of being efficient and stuff. So if you disagree with the creative decision, I've learned that, you know, you, you just got to you go with it. you got to go with it because ultimately they're the client. Um, they know what's best. Um, you can inject your opinion and try to steer them, but like I said, ultimately, you got to leave your ego at the door and just push the project forward, forward so that it yeah. gets to the next stage. Right. It's interesting you say all this because as someone who has created my own products and designed right. them, uh, I get to be that main stakeholder <laughs> that decides what right. I want. And the reason I ask you is because I, I myself have come up against restrictions in terms of time, mm -hmm. budget, like R&D like budgets, right? They're, you could spend forever trying to create the perfect right. product, but then you'd never release it because you're constantly iterating, mm -hmm. revising and so, and so forth. And it just it's like it's a you could you could it's like it's a black hole of how much money you could spend. So at the end of the day, you need to put I need to put out a product that I think is like this is this is fine for like, now. This will this will be good for now. I can sell this. But there's always a future version that I want to mm -hmm. improve. That's why we have, you know, the 13th iPhone. Right, right. Uh, or actually more than yeah. that. But yeah, it's like we have so many iPhones because you get to revise mm -hmm. and reiterate. But with a with the creative asset, you don't have that. It's not like you make, you know, V2 of a music video that came out a year ago. It's like when it's done, it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and and so these are the, the things I think about. It's like, okay. Like I want to do the best job I can because I know once it's out there, it's not like I'm going to go back and change it yeah. again. And, and, it, and it stays like that forever. Uh, so I think it's a very unique challenge in terms of understanding what am I OK with? And once I'm once I, once I put it out there, it's like, hey, I really right. it. you know, that that's that, that it, it's it is off what it my is hands now. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. As long as you're, you know, putting out a good product for the consumer, your client and you feel 100% about it and you know that you did the best you could um, and that you're honoring them and, mm -hmm. you know, making it the best it could possibly be, then yeah, you, you can just let it go. I think I re I don't remember the exact quote, but I was reading this book on advertising and it was the, the founder of this really large ad agency or maybe it was the head creative director and he was like honestly you just need to not care and that sounds really bad but <laughs> he elaborated on it he was like 
I've been in this industry for 40 years. And what I mean by not care is, you know, you have to think a year from now, I'm not going to remember what I was nitpicking on, you know, yes, Mm -hmm. on a project that, you know, the client loved, you know, I'm not going to remember, you know, all the fights or the long hours that I had trying to push my agenda through so that this one little thing would be tweaked. The consumer is not going to know the, the end user is not going to, you know, see all that work. So why should we, you know, stress and like spend so much kill ourselves over it, you know, when you know, the product's going to be good, the end user is not going to know, you know, what it took to make, make it all. Yeah. And especially you, you're not going to remember it a year from now. You're not going to remember it 40 years from now. So he was like, I just want you to know that you shouldn't care in that way. Unless they're I'm, like me, because yeah. I'm petty. Right. <laughs> I'll remember yeah. I'll remember the little things. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. He was like, you can yeah. you can spend so much more time and energy, you know, on stuff that actually matters. Yeah. So. I I have a quirky question. Oh sorry, you go ahead. Yeah. Well, sorry, my, my question is a little antagonistic. <laughs> uh I was wondering, Brett, like has there been a time when you've been on set and you're just like so frustrated <laughs> or upset? <laughs> Uh, and you just like lose your cool. Have, have you done that before? I can't, or are you just like, can really I just composed? say before Brad answers, I yeah. cannot picture Brad to be I, that. I, I can't either. No, no, no. I agree. Okay, I so can't I'm, either. Yeah. I'm really curious to, to hear this answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually I've gotten this compliment multiple times from multiple clients on, on my sets. Um, they like how calm and collected I am. They say I'm very Zen. They say mm. that yeah. I put them at ease. They say that I don't radiate any sort of stress at all. And I think that's that's a gift because I've been on sets with other directors or I've heard horror stories where the directors and they're not even like big directors. They're like at my level or a little bit, bit below or above. And they'll like throw things. They'll be like <laughs> indecisive. They'll like yell and cuss at their crew if, you know, the shot isn't right or if things aren't like going the way they want. Um, they'll you know, talk back to clients, they'll, yeah. And what I've realized as a director is that you're in a leadership position and Mm -hmm. as a leader, the crew kind of like look to you for morale. If they see that you're stressed, they're going to, you know, kind of be stressed too. If they see that you're anxious, they're going to be like, oh, something's wrong and stuff. And it's going to just put everyone on edge. So I've realized that like, the best working environment, even if you're like super stressed or if you're like super frustrated at the client, you can't let that show. You got to you got to inspire morale. It's it's kind of like leading an army Mm -hmm. or like, you know, leading a team. Yeah. 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 Brad reminds me of like it's like a a fixated. um, I mean, a a fixed point, you know what I mean? Amidst the chaos, like you can you can just focus on Brad and you'll right. be like, all right, and, you're, and, and you're you'll fine. be fine. Exactly. Like, yeah, everything yeah. is okay. He is be- steady. He is like, that's he a good word, going. steady. Because earlier when he was saying that he went to, to he wanted to be a doctor or he, he went to medical school, right? Um, oddly enough, Brad, and this is a compliment, the way you're speaking, the way you hold yourself, the way you, 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 cho- you choose your words, I'm in, in the background, I'm thinking, yeah, he'd be a good doctor. <laughs> like I had a, yeah, cause I had a doctor and I, my doctor yeah. right now, my current doctor, um, he has that same air of like, it's almost like the moment I step in and I just hear his voice, I already know I'm going to be okay. Cause it's different. Like it's a, it's a huge thing. You know what I mean? He's laughing. Nice. Actually, I can imagine your doctor be like, Michael, you're dying. No. You're like, oh, thank you God. And you're like, wait, no. hold on. <laughs> well, you're going to laugh at this because the last time I saw him, he basically told me to stop being a little bitch. <laughs> Cause I kept complaining about all these things. And he's like, he looks at me, he kind of shakes his head. He's like, listen, if you have so many problems, if it keeps reoccurring, then just schedule an appointment. But if you're fine, 
then you're fine. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah. That was super nice. Yeah. It's very nice of him. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. very nice of him. But I got the message. I okay, I get it. And then I I got home and my wife's like, so what did he, what did he say? And I'm like, well, he basically told me to stop being a little bitch. And then she started laughing. She's like, I've been telling you that for years. And I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. But yeah, Brad has that that um, that uh, I guess personality that you want to listen to him when he speaks. And actually, you, when you said, when you asked that question, like, if, wait, did he answer that question? I'm sorry. No, he, he did, right? Did you I did answer, answer it, right? Okay, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, his answer is, he's, he's basically, his answer was, people tell me. I am very, zen. like, Okay, yeah, I like that. Zen. I like that. Right. Well, to answer your question, I've never, like, blown up or, like, thrown anything. And I think, you know, it's easy to focus a lot on what I do as a director and the air that I exude. But you can't do that without a great team. Like I'm lucky to have, you know, some of the hardest working people, you know, in my core group that, you know, are not only really creative, but do their best work and are really good at, you know, talking to people and, you know, being people, 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 mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Pe yeah, yeah, that makes people. sense. Yeah, people, people, pe people. Yeah, a people yeah. person. Yeah, people, so you people. can't do it without yeah. a good core group of like, team members and stuff because mm -hmm. filmmaking does take a village i i think when when i was on set with brad the one part that really stood out is i'm like yeah these are some really hard working mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. you know and there was there was no moment at all where i felt like oh that crew member is just standing around doing right. nothing you know like everyone was like so active and so proactive yeah. Uh, and that and that comes down to you know who you choose to work with, right? Like that doesn't happen on accident. There are definitely people who don't work nearly as hard, but Brad has managed to acquire a group of people that he really trusts, and that that he is like, oh yeah, if I bring this person on, they're gonna do a kick-ass job, uh, and that that was so apparent. And and I think that's like, I. I would like to believe that's what it's like for, you know, most professional, uh, you know, crews and whatnot, but I could totally see how in the real world, you just have people who aren't as like as hardworking. Um, and that goes for any industry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it's just great to see that with Brad. It's like, no, these are, these are some like top, top like level individuals, uh, who like, no matter what they're doing, they're doing a really good job of it. Um, and that's what made it fun yeah. too. Right. When you see everyone working hard, you're like, I want right. to work hard. Yeah. I was going to say that I think Brad has, if I'm, you know, if I'm assuming correctly, Brad really chooses the people he, he wants to be around with, because I, I fairly firmly believe in that, that you can only grow so much if you surround yourself with people who are opposed to that, right? Like of your, your growth and just progress and just, you know, better things. So right. I imagine Brad to be that same person, like, okay, I'm going to bring in people who I think is going to add and not just subtract from the overall equation, right? Because that's very, very important. And I know Yi, I know Yi for sure knows this. Like he will not work with people who is just gonna keep, he, who he has to, to hold their hands all the time. I mean, Yi is always yelling at me. He's not yelling at me, but he's always just like on my, always texting me. He's like, okay, where is this? You said you were gonna do that. Like accountability, accountability. That's what it is. So it's very important. So I imagine Brad to be the same thing. Like, he really chooses the people he works with. I'd love yeah. to watch him work one of these days. I'll yeah, come out on the set. Where are you based? I'm in San Diego. <laughs> okay, cool. It's not too far. It's not too far. Yeah, not too yeah. far. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, Brad, get us, get us on, get us on set again. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're all the way in the Midwest. <laughs> I will. I I will fly. No, like if you tell me, hey, this this thing is coming up, I will fly over just to hang out. I'll be an extra, right? Sweet. Or I'll I'll do whatever you. I'll, I want to see you. Do I'll that, yeah. <laughs> I have I have one yeah. quirky question, and yeah. uh, this is just something that I'm trying to relate myself with in what I do to what you do, right? So, um, how often do you say no to clients? I think does that happen a lot. Yeah. So starting out. I was really, really afraid to say no because I knew, and I still know it's a game. Like you, as a freelancer, as someone who kind of depends on the flow of work to earn your living, um, there's a fear you develop of, you know, saying no because you get you become afraid of you know clients moving on to the next person, and then you get scared like if they do a good job, they're not going to ask you again. 
and mm -hmm. stuff or they'll like forget about you and stuff um and it wasn't until like maybe fairly recently like two or three years ago that i started saying no to projects and stuff i felt like i had built up a name for myself and a reputation and i also had a constant flow of work and clients that i really enjoyed working with and stuff so that's when i was finally able to say no because i had moved past that fear and stuff and i think it just comes with maturing and mm -hmm. you know maturity in your career kind of comes at different stages for everyone for me uh, going back to the whole milestone thing i i think i need to see progress in order to feel you know to feel good about something i need to hit certain milestones and i need to see like tangible evidence in order to feel good about something right. and so um two years ago was when i was able to be like okay i'm gonna just start saying no see what happens and stuff this project either doesn't pay enough or i'm gonna be putting way too much work into this or i'm not even if it's like something as trivial as like i'm not particularly you know inspired by this you know proposal or this product yeah or even like the song like i can't stand the song you mm -hmm. know <laughs> but it's a bigger artist you know yeah. you can say no mm -hmm. yeah there yeah. is power there there, yeah. is power there is power in, yeah in saying no and it's yeah. actually very very crucial i think for people you're right though like it's not like you can just say to people and i've said this i've told people just say no but I think you ha you hit a good point. You said you, when you said that it's it's also part of maturing into this in what you do, right? Your job, because only you can really s know when it's time to to start. Um, I guess choosing better clients at this point, because it does. You know, it you can't sustain like terrible client work <laughs> right. for the rest of your career. I've tried that, and it's not. It's just not sustainable it's going to drain you and you find your, I found myself just not churning out good work. And I became like this soulless production artist kind of. Right. So I completely get that. Well, that's yeah. awesome. I appreciate that. I like that answer. Yeah. And going back to being upfront and transparent, you know, it's, it's a relationship. Even if it's like the first time someone's like reaching out to you, if they're like, Hey, you know, can you do this project for X amount and you don't feel passionate either about the creative behind it or um, can, or if you can't do anything with the budget they give you, you could be like, Hey, um, you seem really cool or the product seems really cool or this artist seems really cool. But, you know, honestly, because of the budget, I don't think I can take it on. And sometimes mm -hmm. they'll come back to you like a year later, two years later, be like hey i have this budget now mm -hmm. um let's let's work and then you can make the decision again but as long at least for me as long uh, sorry for me um as long as you're upfront about why you can't do it um then maybe it plants the seeds for future endeavors together yeah but it never like closes the door you just don't want to outright ghost them or say no yeah yeah gotta give your reasoning that's actually what i was gonna yeah. say it's important yeah. that you give your reason because it gives yeah. them a chance right because there's there you know for two people to say yes yeah they have to to be on board you know a certain number of things right so right. at least you're giving them that 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 reason why you can't be on board and mm -hmm. it gives them a chance because you know I, I also believe in you know we have to compromise somehow Right. We have to give people the chance to make adjustments as well so that we can all get along. Because if we approach work, life, clients, whatever, with a, just a hard line that says, you know, black and white, yes or no. Yeah, nothing's really I mean, I don't know anyone who's who's managed to to, to approach life that way and I guess be happy or right. successful. So that, that, that's a that's a good um, point. I actually wrote that yeah. down in my head. What you just said to um, how important it is. At least he's not forgetting me. I'm always like, I agree. I, no, I, agree. Mental I, no, I agree. That's like, <laughs> it, it's, it, Brad makes yeah. a great point. Uh, 
so I had a question that popped up right as you were talking about, you know, learning when to say no because it's just not worth it or whatnot. Um, what is like if you were to brag about yourself just for a moment, um, because, you know, there's a reason that people want to choose you. Right. You know, what is it that you feel like sets you apart from other other directors uh, and producers? I think two things. Um, first is my work ethic. I know that's like super, super general, but I've always prided myself on working hard. And I think it was because growing up in like an Asian American household, you know, whose grandparents had immigrated from China, all you have is your work ethic. You know, some people might not be fortunate enough to get an education like my grandpa did, you know, but it was because of his work ethic that he was able to achieve the American dream. And I think that work ethic was instilled in my parents. And I saw that growing up yeah. as well and the rewards of that. And they were always like, yeah, the work, your work ethic and, you know, not being above doing like menial tasks or, you know, putting in the extra time to learn something, that's all going to pay off. And it's really important because that's all you really have. Mm -hmm. People can be born in yeah. different situations, but, you know, your work ethic will set you apart. So I think that's really helped me in this industry, too, especially in an industry where so many people uh, try to su succeed and make a living. Not everybody succeeds. I've had uh, colleagues from film school, you know, just give up and move back home because one, they didn't have a plan. Two, they, even though they thought they put in the work, they, you know, they, uh, they just got tired of grinding mm -hmm. and you can't get tired of grinding. You just, gotta wake up every day and stay motivated or even if you're not working you gotta you know push yourself to you know either grow personally or uh grow your, like your business network and stuff so yeah work ethic the second thing that sets me apart in terms of how i work in this industry is i think it's my ability to see the bigger picture from a post-production perspective. I started out as an editor. Um, I've been editing since I was 11. My dad taught me how to use Final Cut Pro and stuff. And so a how lot cool of, that is. Yeah. So a lot of <laughs> wow, a lot of how I approach shot lists on set planning and stuff, or even just making decisions on set comes from a post-production standpoint. Like I've worked with directors or have heard stories of directors doing like 50 takes when you have like a, a 12 hour day and you don't like, you don't move anywhere on your shot list or you don't make any progress in terms of what you need to shoot in order to get the project done. And I think as an editor, I've yeah. become very efficient in the way I make decisions on set because I'll like hear something or see something and I'll be like, okay, that's good enough. We can move on. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, hey, you said this. Can you rephrase it like this for the edit? Because I know what clients expect. And I've had those conversations with um, account managers and stakeholders on the post-production side where they'll be like, oh, we're kind of looking for this soundbite or we're kind of looking for this moment. You know, do you have it? And with all of those conversations I've had and all of that experience, when I go to set, if I'm working with the client again or if I'm working just with a similar client, I know what they're going to expect on the post end. So I make my decisions based on that. And that's resulted in me being really efficient and being able to delegate things. That's smart. Yeah. yeah. I want to say that stand, that makes so much sense to me because I remember when, when, while we were on set, brad was shockingly efficient with the shots right. like it was like it like like you said people might do a ton of takes but with brad it's like oh like two takes yeah cool next shot and do another take all right cool let's get like this rolling shot right let's get some sound like it was just so efficient um like the total opposite like if i think of when you like michael i bet when you take photos you take quite a mm -hmm. few photos 
uh, like, do you frame it up? Oh, I'm gonna try this angle and try yeah. that angle. And it's like the polar opposite for bread. Like from what mm-hmm. I've seen, it's like, nope, we got the shot. That's Let's crazy. Move on. It's like extremely efficient. Yeah, it is. Like now that I think about it, it is insane because that means you you leave so little room for, like, oh, like, do we have another angle of this or another yeah. shot of this? But it seems like Brad just has a really great great way of visualizing. Oh no, like I know exactly what shots I'm gonna need. And in fact, not only am I like not only is he efficient in how he gets the shots, but at the end of the day when he's editing, it's like, oh no, like we have more than plenty to work with. Right. Yeah, Um, and I've been on like the other end where I'm like editing for, you know, a director or a creative director. And I'll like look at the footage and it'll be like fifty takes of the same exact thing, just slight differences and i end up not using it and i'm like what did you burn all this media on and all this time on and yeah, stuff because you're like yeah. wasting the client's money you're wasting time on set you could have been getting more coverage other stuff and that's what really frustrated me as an editor so mm-hmm. when i'm on set i'm like you know we're gonna get this this and this we have a shot list and we're gonna you know we're gonna plan we're still going to make a good like babble plan and get all the shots we need, but we're not going to spend time shooting a shot 50 times. Right. We're not going to, you know, nitpick and stuff if it's good enough, because I know in posts we can like either clean it up or make it look different mm-hmm. and stuff. Like there's a joke on set where people say, Oh, fix it in post and stuff. And the reason why it's a joke is because the people who say it usually don't know how post works. Yeah, I know. Yeah. In my experience, that's <laughs> yeah. exactly yeah. true. <laughs> yeah, but I know how post production works, so I'm I can genuinely say yes, so we can correct that in post. Yeah, I think one last thing is when Brad, when you you talk about like your work right. ethic, that also is so clear Thank to me you. because I've never I never expected you to turn around like a first pass so quickly. You know, after we had wrapped shooting. Uh, Michael, this is like you can look up to him about this. Like it, it was phenomenal. Uh, I was shocked. I'd be like, nervous. We I'd be. I'm the type of guy who will try to cover everything just to make sure I don't make you know I don't miss anything. But it seems like Brad has so much experience already that he knows when he has the shot. You know what I mean? Because right. most of the time when I say that I got the shot, I I don't have the shot. That's usually how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least my experience. Well, like I said, um, you have to make a battle plan first. You have to follow the shot list, especially if like an agency or like a client gives you a specific, mm-hmm. you know, set of parameters to shoot in. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I found is that, you know, if you plan beforehand, that leaves, you know, time on set that you could spend playing jazz. You know, you could do more improv with your shots and get stuff that you and the client you know could could have only seen on set through the monitor mm-hmm. and stuff yeah. yeah yeah i remember the first time i saw the first shot on the monitor and i thought okay everything's gonna be <laughs> you know like they're they're using like the 6k camera uh and i, I just saw it there and i thought wow it looks professional so it looks real yeah. And, yeah i was like yeah brad is brad is legit. a real deal you know, like, I, I, I saw like i've seen his real yeah, and right. everything but like to see it all happen in real time i'm like okay yeah like i i have nothing to worry right. about and even like yeah you know on set when we're improvising and when when things aren't going exactly as we think they right. are or like the the environment not is not exactly as we hoped it would be brad is still like oh no like calm cool collected we'll do this we'll do that you know and created something out of mm-hmm, nothing right. you know for some of the shots i'm like this is this is part of the like i think that i think one part you didn't state which is huge is your adaptability and your creativity mm. uh like yeah you're to be able to work through uh restrictions and environment and to create something like in our commercial it looks like we're in a nightclub but in reality we're in this dark warehouse with three lights and a, and a smoke machine uh, and, you know, a bar made out of just like two like like craft. Yeah, that we turned. On, <laughs> yeah. 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 And like we put on Apple boxes. Yeah. Right. Like 
like, it was crazy. I, 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 like, it's like, I, I, I remember the behind the scenes and like what actually transpired. And I look at the shot and I'm thinking, I cannot believe that the this end is, result, you know, the yeah, same right. thing, the end result. And it's phenomenal. That is so cool. Yeah. I have to watch it again. It's been a while since I saw it, but I remember seeing it. And I'm like, yeah, this guy's legit. Like, I thought it was going to be like, yeah, I, I know this filmmaker guy, you know, he can make a commercial for us. I'm like, okay, you know, let's, let's see. And I saw it. I'm like, yeah. oh yeah, this guy's legit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's this one quote, um, that I always make fun of, um, that like these really pretentious film students always quote in their like black and white photos. They're like, <laughs> oh, cinema is, you know, 24 frames of truth. And I'm like, no, t- cinema is 24 frames of lying, you know? <laughs> That's more accurate. You know? Yeah. Yeah, you lie all the time. That is yeah. an accurate yeah. description of cinema. Yeah. I love that. That should be your yeah. quote. That should be, <laughs> no, yeah. don't use that. But that, was gonna yeah. say. that should be a shirt. Yeah. That should that be a shirt. Like on everything. Yeah. 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 yeah, but that. like, yeah, wow. really artsy, pretentious, like filmmakers and yeah, stuff will always quote that with their photos. <laughs> yeah, or you'll see it on like yeah, Pinterest. And yeah, stuff. but it's like <laughs> I, I can just see Brad's head. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> that's not good. That's yeah, not it's good. lying at twenty-four frames a second. That's exactly an accurate description of what's in yeah. I love that. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Well, Brad, it's been a pleasure. I know we're already at the hour. And it feels like oh, we can go fast. on. Yeah, I know. It feels yeah. like we can go on some more, but yeah. we obviously respect your time. Um, before we go, can you share with the with the listeners where they can find you? If you have a real or a, a social media account or even a website, what would that be? Yeah, just follow me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is Bradley Dubs, B R A D L E Y D U B B S. You can see all of my work. You can see pictures of my Australian Shepherd. Um, yeah, it's just kind of like a, a fruit salad of content there. A fruit salad of content. <laughs> but, Great. Yeah, Great. but I mostly post my work and I have links to my work in the in the description. And if you want to reach out, send me a DM. I don't always check them, but try to respond. Mm-hmm. It's funny. Every time I like follow this... Oh, never mind. I was going to say, every time I follow like an NFT like account or like a... <laughs> A crypto account. Uh-huh. I'll get all these DMs saying, "Oh, check out our new NFT. Get in early on this new NFT." So that feels so, feels so scary. It is scammy. <laughs> so in order to offset that, please send me a DM. Let's talk about creative stuff. Let's work. I love stuff. that. Yeah, I'd love to see your messages <laughs> more than all the scammers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If yeah. you start offering Brad NFTs. Uh, he's just going to delete your DM right away. <laughs> well, Brad, thank yeah. you so much for being on the Coffee Creators Podcast again. Yee, I don't know if you have anything else that you wanted to share before we... Uh... No, I, I, I love that you came on, Brad. I, I think I I wanted this to be a chance for you know people to understand what it's like, what a joy it was you know to work with you and how how cool it is to, to basically you know hear about you know like how you got to this point and that really like... I think for a lot of creators, they feel like, oh, I stumbled into this and, and whatnot. But for you, you are like, you plan mm-hmm. this. It's not like you're a person with a plan. You really care about knowing your next steps. Uh, and the part that stood out to me the most was you can be your most creative when you have a plan. Whereas a lot of people might say, oh, I like to not have a plan and just like go and just like ad lib it. Uh, but like, it's like, you know, I think I, I would, I totally agree with what you're saying because once you have this almost like a safe environment to work with, you're like, okay, now I can really try be crazy and not be afraid yeah. of, of what happens if it mm-hmm. doesn't succeed. Right. Cause I, I still, mm-hmm. it's yeah. like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but within the creative environment. Love yeah. that. Thank you guys again for listening to the Coffee Week Creators Podcast. I just wanted to send a quick reminder to please support the show by sharing this with your friends and your family. And we are trying something new, which is uh, this video podcast is actually going to be uploaded on Spotify aside from YouTube. And on YouTube, please help us reach 100 subscribers because it's going to be easier for people to find us once we have a custom URL. Uh, reach out to us on Instagram at coffeewcreators or email us at coffeewithcreatorspodcast at gmail.com. And once again, thank you for listening to the Coffee with Creators Podcast. This is your host, Michael, and I hope you can come hang out with us again next time. Bye. 
Bye. Bye. Thanks for having me.